Thank you, Michael. Uh, Dan uh, Oren started out with Ernest Rutherford's comments about science being only physics and stamp, uh, there being only physics and everything else was stamp collecting. I started out in college to be uh, a nuclear physicist um, and then I changed. So I, I didn't think I switched to majoring in stamp collecting, but uh, I did switch from trying to understand the behavior of the neutrino to understanding the behavior of humans um, and pathology. And so, um, I think that was a good decision, at least for me. Um, another thing Dan mentioned is that there, um, often the story is more complex than we think and there are more factors involved in understanding things uh, that we might uh, first be aware of. Um, and so I'd like to thank the organization for inviting me to come and give this talk about psychological factors because I think uh, there actually is quite a lot of evidence for different roles that psychological factors can play in. Uh, both the etiology and treatment of seasonal depression. Um, and it's a topic that doesn't get discussed very often in this meeting. Um, and so I'm looking forward to be able to share some of this research and some of these ideas with you. Assuming I figure the right button. Okay, so there are three things that I'd like to uh, uh, talk about today. Um, we'll see the, how the time works for the varying details of all of this. Um, one is that there are psych the research supports that there are psychological factors in the etiology, um, or you might say pathogenesis, of seasonal symptomatology. Um, and some of these factors might be similar to other factors, factors that are in other kinds of depression, of clinical depression. If we think of uh, seasonal affective disorder as a clinical depression, then there might be some shared psychological factors. And there also might be some unique relationships that are specific to seasonal affective disorder, and I'll talk about that. Uh, then I'd like to briefly uh, talk a little bit about uh, interventions uh, that are more psychologically and behaviorally oriented. Um, that sort of build on the ideas of the, of the first point and give us some possible opportunities for other kinds of interventions, um, not in necessarily instead of late treatment. Um, and then also I'd like to talk about the roles of cognitive behavioral interventions in light treatment because I think there's definitely some contributions that health psychology and uh, behavioral interventions can contribute to uh, maximizing our light treatment effectiveness. Uh, so I thought I might say a few things about why did I entitle this talk uh, Seasonal Depression and not Seasonal Affective Disorder, which is wh how most people would refer to what I'm talking about. And I think there were a few points that I wanted to make about this. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'll actually focus on the second one, which is that uh, we have diagnostic criteria, either um, the uh, older, more traditional Rosenthal criteria or the slightly altered DSM criteria, and those, of course, divide people into those who have SAD and those who don't have SAD. And I think we all who work in the field realize that this is really more on a continuum than a dichotomy, um, but I think our language sometimes makes a difference in how we think and how we do our research, and so um, I think it's useful to think of this as seasonal depression rather than necessarily seasonal affective disorder, although I'm not on a soapbox to get rid of the term seasonal affective disorder. Um, um, second, we know that there are normal variations in physiological and vegetative functioning um, and that there being seasonal variations is not pathological in and of itself, um, although there obviously these vary from individual to individual and in how severe they are and for people with severe seasonal physiological and vegetative um, functions that can actually be more pathological and more problematic. Um, the third point is that we usually, the more traditional way of thinking about diagnoses and symptomatology, whether we're actually aware of it in, uh, or not, is that there's a disorder that we either have or don't have, or we have to varying extents, and that underlying disorder generates all of our symptoms. And so our symptoms cluster together because, um, sort of equally, because uh, we have this underlying disorder, whether we consider it as dichotomous or continuous doesn't really make a difference for that. Um, but there's no reason to necessarily 
assume that these are all just manifestations of a single underlying process. Um, and that what I've got up here are the nine DSM criteria for major depression, uh, which we use for diagnosing SAD. Uh, we also know other symptoms often go along with depression that aren't necessarily in the um, DSM, like hopelessness and helplessness and anxiety. Um, um, but it doesn't mean that these are all necessarily driven by one homogeneous underlying process. Um, and this is really sort of the start for um, my work in looking at psychological factors. Um, and uh, the first study I did in this was I was interested in how the symptoms actually develop over time because people go from being not depressed to being depressed and having all those depressive symptoms. So what's that process? How does that evolve over that onset period? Um, and so um, uh, these are data from that first 1991 study. Um, and what we found was that um, the symptoms that are on the top row, one of them disappeared. It should say fatigue, uh, appetite, wait, oh, sleep would have been over here in this column. It's just a formatting issue. That those vegetative sort of symptoms all were occurring at the beginning of the episode. So we did a careful reconstruction with people who were in an episode of seasonal affective disorder about when each and every symptom started. And I won't go through the procedures for how we did that. We did it as carefully as we could with a lot of different checks. Um, and then this is plotted with the beginning is week one of the episode, indicated by the first symptom. And then this is week two of the episode, and as the episode develops, regardless of calendar date. Um, and what we found was that fatigue and increased sleep and uh, increased appetite and weight all were starting at the very beginning. And all of these other more cognitive and affective symptoms were starting at all different times, spread through the whole episode. Um, and that suggested to me that there were really two different processes going on here. It wasn't one homogeneous uh, process driving all these symptoms. There were two different things, at least, uh, going on. And since that original study, which was really this retrospective uh, reconstruction, um, there have been uh, two prospective studies um, that have uh, looked at this and have found the same thing. Um, this is data from Stacy Whitcomb uh, Smith. Uh, the first plot is in terms of the cumulative probability of the onset occurring by that week, and these are actually calendar weeks starting uh, with the uh, um, uh, autumn solstice. Um, and, uh, equinox, I'm sorry. And uh, you can see that the solid line is the vegetative symptoms, and, and so 40% of people um, had, had their vegetative symptoms started um, by the middle of September, which I think is actually a little interesting. It's earlier than we normally think most people starting, although maybe the prospective nature of the data collection made a difference. And these are the more mood and psychological symptoms that lag behind and catch up later. And this is in terms of actual symptom severity, and it shows the same thing, that there's um, uh, an early onset of the vegetative symptoms with the psychological symptoms coming in later, and actually sort of persisting longer, which I think is sort of an interesting idea. I don't think the data prove this, uh, but it's an interesting notion. Um, so out of this came this dual vul vulnerability model, but there are really two things going on in, in SAD. One are physiological changes um, with, that are large um, in the season, and the other are psychological vulnerabilities to develop these cognitive and affective symptoms um, in the face of or in response to the depressive symptoms. So there's really two processes going on. Um, and people who have actual diagnosable SAD then would have both because in order to meet the criteria, you need some collection of vegetative and cognitive and affective symptoms. Um, so a few things, I think I'll run through these fairly quickly. Some of the kinds of evidence that supports uh, this model. Um, if you do factor analyses of uh, self-report scales of symptoms, you do get separate clusters of vegetative and cognitive affective symptoms. Um, um, White and Terman, looking at their C, I believe these were CET data from their website. Um, uh, the the uh, model would suggest there are people who only have the vegetative changes. They don't have the vul psychological vulnerabilities. And so you would see vegetative seasonal changes, but without the mood changes, without the other depressive changes. And they found that that was actually 
the case, and I think that's the case in our clinical experience. If we, if we see these patients, and they often don't come in if they don't have the more psychological symptoms, but when we do, we do see people who seem to just have vegetative changes. Um, there are also a variety of um, psychological constructs that have been very, all of these have been very well studied in um, unipolar depression, um, and then they play a role. So, uh, and there are a variety of studies that have looked at these things. Uh, so neuroticism as a personality characteristic is related to severity of uh, winter depressive symptoms. Um, dysfunctional attitudes are attitudes and beliefs that are maladaptive uh, when you're in, in a low mood. Uh, negative attributional style is uh, sometimes causal, time called causal attributional style. Um, so when something bad happens, a negative style is to say, it's because of me, something about me, it's going to stay this way forever and it's going to affect everything I do. So I don't get a grant. If I, if I tend to respond by saying, oh, it's because I'm really not a very good researcher, um, uh, it actually uh, will affect all sorts of everything in my life and career, and it's just going to stay this way and not get any, ever be any different. Those people who have those sort of causal attributional styles have a higher risk for depression, have longer uh, episodes of depression. This is in non-seasonal depression. On the other hand, if I say, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm still really a great researcher. I'm not sure why I didn't get this. Oh, I see there's a flaw in this particular proposal, but that doesn't mean my next proposal can't be good. And even though um, my department chair will be unhappy that I didn't get this grant, my wife still loves me and I have a wonderful family uh, and I still love to ski, um, then those people are much less likely to have depressive problems. The one I want to focus on a little bit more is uh, rumination, uh, which is an um, uh, sort of a coping mechanism that I've studied more and has more study in the literature. Um, so these are passive repetitive thoughts about um, how, I'm fe how bad I'm feeling, why am I feeling this way, what's going to happen to me. They're just repetitive passive thoughts. They're not problem solving thoughts, although people sometimes think that the more I think about these questions, I'm going to get out of my depression, or get, which is not true. It actually interferes with cognition, prolongs mood. Um, and so there have been these correlational studies that show also that uh, rumination is correlated with severity of uh, seasonal affective disorder. Um, so sometimes these are measured, rumination is measured as a trait. How much do you tend to respond like this? Um, we've also done studies that have looked experience sampling method, uh, sometimes called uh, ecological momentary assessment, where people fill out questionnaires, in this case five times a day for seven days, um, and reported how much, how fatigued they felt in the last 30 minutes, um, what their mood was like, and also whether they were ruminating about their fatigue, and these were multi-item uh, questions. Um, uh, and so what we found is that ruminating about fatigue at, at one time predicted mood at the next time, controlling for mood at the first time. And also, um, acceptance is another thing in the psychology literature that if you don't, if you reject and suppress your experience, that actually doesn't make you get better, it makes you get worse. Um, and it's better to accept, for example, that I'm fatigued, that I'm gaining weight. Not accept it in the sense of not make a plan to do something about it, but accept having the experience that that at the moment is the way you are. And that also predicted um, ex of acceptance of fatigue and acceptance of hunger predicted mood at the next time point, which was an hour and a half or two hours later. Um, so um, this, again, is a longitudinal study, and uh, so there's a little bit more sense of process and causality. Um, so one way to think about this is that um, cognitive vulnerabilities to depression, like I've been talking about, really are sort of a diathesis and a diathesis stress model for seasonality, and that the vegetative changes act as the stressor, which then trigger the psychological uh, processes, which then together make up SAD. So um, I just wanted to put this slide up. You can look at it later. There's, there's three studies um, here that use slightly different methodologies, which I think is a good um, thing because they all come to the same conclusions. Uh, they all measure something about, whoops, they all measure something about uh, vegetative symptom severity in different ways, about um, uh, cognitive factors in one way, or uh, mood or 
psychological symptoms in one way, and then about rumination in one way or another too. And they all come up with the same sort of results, so I'm just going to show you the results for, for this study where people uh, rated their fatigue and their mood and their rumination on 14 consecutive days. And so if you focus on the mean level of rumination, as you might expect, either from the, the idea that there's one underlying disorder driving all these symptoms, you'd expect fatigue to be related to your mood, or based on the idea that people's mood is a response to their fatigue, you'd expect um, fatigue and mood to be related. And you find, in fact, on average, the more tired people are on a day, the worse their mood is on that day. However, that's not the whole story. Um, if you ruminate a lot, that relationship is a lot stronger. Your fatigue has a lot bigger impact on your mood. And if you ruminate less, there's less of an association. And in fact, if you ruminate two standard deviations below the mean, there's no relationship between your mood and, your, um, and fatigue. So the relationship between these symptoms is dependent on how much you ruminate. Rumination is a part of this whole process in uh, understanding the, the symptomatology of SAD. Um, so this is sort of a summary of the first part uh, of the talk. Um, so there's evidence that the occurrence of symptoms and the severity of symptoms is partially related to psychological processes in addition to biological processes. Um, um, I think I'm going to skip this second point for the moment. Um, and also the maladaptive coping and maladaptive emotion regulation um, really increases symptom severity and increases the impairment and distress of, uh, of our patients. And uh, to a large extent, we're treating people because they're having distress and impairment. If somebody has, no has symptoms but has no distress about them and they're unimpaired, they probably don't need to be treated. So the idea of dealing with patients in distress and impairment is actually important for us as clinicians. So the second issue that I want to talk about really briefly is um, that they're based on these ideas, there's been developed, which you might know about, um, a more cognitive behavioral approach to uh, treating SAD. Um, the idea being to work specifically on the psychological factors that are part of SAD, not all of SAD. Um, and so Kelly Rowan at the University of Vermont has adapted um, um, CBT specifically for SAD. Um, and there's really three components that I'll just touch on because they, they give an idea of, how, again, how it touches some of the traditional um, psychology research on depression and a, a taste of what doing this sort of intervention might consist of. Um, and so one is psychoeducation, and, and all this, a number of these things, I'm sure, as clinicians, even if we never heard of, we still do some of these things. It's not that this is unique. All of these things are unique, although I think some aspects are relatively unique. Um, one is education of our patients about the interplay of physiology and seasons and psychology and SAD. Um, another big piece is what's known in the depression literature as behavioral activation, that uh, people who have depressed have withdrawn from positive rewarding, reinforcing experiences, which contributes to their depression. Um, they've lost the sense of reward contingency, that if I do this, good things happen or bad things happen, and make assumptions about, for example, that um, uh, I cannot go bowling anymore. Whereas that's probably an overgeneralization. Or if I go bowling, I won't enjoy it anymore. And actually, some, for some patients, that's, that's true. But for other patients, actually, when they actually engage in activities, they find out they do enjoy them. They just aren't doing them, and they believe that they won't in, enjoy them. And so uh, some of these things are worked with uh, to get people to uh, choose whoops, to um, uh, how to uh, select and plan activities, um, how to overcome obstacles to those behaviors, including their thoughts and beliefs, and how to facilitate people engaging in rewarding activities more. And this, in addition to providing positive experiences, also has a feedback on all the other behavioral problems that people have. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail for the sake of time, um, but um, the just like other depressions, uh, people with SAD have a lot of distorted thinking that contributes to their behavior and contributes to their mood. 
Um, so um, the one I was just talking about, they might disqualify the positive. That good time I had was just a fluke. I still have SAD. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, you know, I will suffer from SAD symptoms every, it should be every fall and winter for the rest of my life. You can see that a, th a thought like that would keep people out of light treatment as well. It's just hopeless. Why bother? Um, um, and so these kinds of, this kind of distorted thinking operates in depression in general and by traditional CBT, uh, partially works by working with people to examine these thoughts, to examine their consequences, to look at the evidence for and against, against them, to change their way of thinking, and uh, with the idea that the way we think or understand situations or the meaning of them, uh, to a large extent, not totally, but to a large extent, affects, um, determine our mood and how we feel and the behaviors we engage in. And so um, we can work with people on the nature of their thoughts. Uh, the third part in uh, Rowan's treatment is about relapse prevention, uh, planning for using the techniques that have worked in the, in the past. This would be similar in light treatment, actually, doing, you know, if your light treatment worked, you should use it next year. Um, and working on anticipatory cognitions, because a lot of people with seasonal depression, even before their symptoms start, start getting negative and anxious about what's coming because they've had this happen every year. They know it's probably coming. Um, and a lot of those cognitions are also distorted. And so working on the anticipatory uh, cognitions um, can also help people's outcomes. So that's the end of the second part, sort of a brief idea of uh, there have been several randomized clinical trials using the CBT for SAD that have had positive results. And there's, you may be aware, there's one re, uh, study that suggests that uh, two or three years after the treatment, some of these effects still uh, persist in people having uh, better outcomes, um, even though they, the acute treatment has stopped. Um, there's certainly a lot more room for research that all these studies have come out of Kelly Rowan's lab. We all know from any kind of research that things need to be replicated and investigated further in, in you know, outside of the original lab. Um, and even though there have been three uh, high quality RCTs, um, at least two have been NIMH funded. I don't remember if all three were NIMH funded. Um, there's still more work that needs to be done. We don't know everything. So the final issue I'd like to talk about is our roles for cognitive behavioral interventions in light treatment. Um, uh, health psychology, um, the psychology and of people with medical disorders um, is a really growing area in psychology. Um, there's a big movement now to embed health psychologists in uh, primary care. And this is not just to deal with uh, mental disorders and people coming from primary care. It's actually to get um, better outcomes for medical interventions, paying attention to the psychology and the behavior. And I'll demonstrate how that works. Um, so here's a prescription for light treatment, sort of sketchy. Uh, but I think it captures most of it. Um, obtain a particular light box, sit so many inches in front of it at such a time of the day for so many minutes for so many days a week. Uh, report back how well it's working and any side effects you experience. Uh, continue using it until the spring. And if it works, repeat it next year. So I don't know, maybe, Mikey, you could tear, you could tear like 10 pages out of your book and just stick this one page in. It's a, but there's lots of asterisks, though, that, that call for knowledge and clinical judgment about what actually to fill in. But that, I think, is, is the basic outline of doing light treatment. So the next slide is about what are, what are patients' behaviors about light treatment. And the rest of the slide, you'll notice, is, is identical. Everything we do for the prescription for light treatment is about a patient behavior. Okay. The reason the light is working and that the person gets the, the, what the light does when it gets into your body is a different story. But um, everything we tell the patient to do for light treatment is a patient behavior. And so we have a science of how do we alter and change people's behaviors um, so that they can uh, do this. Um, so a lot of times we think about this as compliance or adherence. In, in medicine, it's usually talked about as compliance to uh, a prescription. And in psychology, it's usually talked about as adherence to a plan. So uh, they have some differences in philosophy, but the bottom line is, is sort of the same. 
Um, so we know actually that writing the prescription for light therapy is relatively easy. You know, there's a lot to know. You can look at people's chronotypes. There's lots of subtleties. But in general, writing the light therapy prescription, um, all those things that were on the previous slide is relatively easy. Um, I like to think about this when I was saying that, that all the prescription is behavior, is that the patient's behavior is the light delivery system. Okay. Just like you might write a prescription for I am Haldol, the injection is the drug delivery system. It need, the treatment needs to be delivered through some delivery system. Um, and in this case, really, the patient's behavior is the light delivery system. And so we want to maximize the, the patient, the, the light treatment delivery system, which means affecting the patient's behavior. Um, and so um, behavior change is really a process. It's not a prescription. And so we've all, if we've ever prescribed anything, um, we, whether it's as a psychologist or, or as a physician, um, you know that you give the prescription and the stupid patient doesn't do it, you know, or doesn't do it all, or it's difficult. So the idea that um, behavior change is not just a prescription, I think, is not that far from our experience, even though we might not think of it that way. And I think thinking about these issues in this way is, actually gives us some opportunities that we might not recognize. Um, so um, there are a lot of well-established, empirically supported behavior change principles and procedures uh, that can, that they haven't been studied in light treatment, but they've been studied in lots of other behavior changes for uh, uh, cardiac change, uh, healthy behavior change for, for cardiac problems, for obesity, for smoking, for diabetes. Um, and so, so there's a common set of, of interventions. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about what those are. And like I said before, I'm sure that most, of, most clinicians have used one aspect of this at a time, one time or another. Um, but I think it's also very useful to think about these as the, the goal is they're not just good clinical practice. You're doing them for a specific purpose, which is to change the patient's behavior in terms of light treatment delivery. Um, and I think if you think about it as behavior change, you end up doing it a little bit differently than if you just think about it as good clinical practice. Um, so the first is psychoeducation. Um, we know that people are more likely to change if they understand how and why you're asking them to make this change. People don't like making changes just because they're told to. Um, so understanding it is helpful. Um, enhancing motivation. Um, we often know that motivation is a complex thing, and if people are not motivated to make changes, they're not going to make changes. I'm going to talk about each of these a little bit more in detail. Um, activity scheduling. In, this, in general, in psychology, we call this activity scheduling, but in this context, the activity is all the things the patient has to do to get the light. Um, so how do you actually schedule that and in a way that's going to actually be likely to happen? And the other, the last is self-monitoring, um, that we want the patient to monitor how they're doing. We want them to report back to us. How do you actually make that work well? Um, so in terms of psychoeducation, we've got um, what's the evidence base that it's effective? Um, why do we think it'll be effective for this particular individual? Um, and how the therapy is you know how does it actually work or how do we think it works because often we don't actually have the absolute answer of, of how it works but um, there's usually some research indicating one method or another um, mechanism or another um, what are the expectations what what course of response do we expect what side effects might occur um, other possible difficulties ask for any questions or concerns just don't allow wait until the patient asks them um, all these are good aspects of uh, psychoeducation. And actually, for any of these four areas that I wrote in psychology, there are many books talking about how to do these things in an effective way. It's, it's not just generic, like educate the patient, um, just like you wouldn't say medicate the patient. Like, what does it, when? What medicines should I give? It doesn't make any difference. Just medicate them. Like, no one would say that. And that's actually the same about these psychological sort of interventions. There is a technology to it. Uh, motivational interviewing is one uh, uh, commonly used method that um, uh, for increasing motivation um, and to get people to commit to a particular course of action. 
um, and which in this case would be the, the uh, treatment delivery behaviors. Um, you want to explore and resolve ambivalences. There may be natural reasons why someone does or doesn't want to uh, do this, um, why there will be costs as well as benefits from engaging in all of those specific uh, behaviors to deliver the light treatment. Um, sometimes there's an, you can work on identifying discrepancies between values and behavior. That's said in a very general way. In this context, values means I want to get better. So if you want to get better, why aren't you doing this? There's a, there's a discrepancy there. We can look into that and try to sort it out, and that helps motivate patients. Um, you have to work with them where they are in terms of readiness to change. You can't have a one-size-fits-all for every patient because people are in different stages of, the, of motivation, of knowledge, and if you just say, well, everybody, I'm just going to shoot for this because everybody should be here, people don't change to get there. You need to sort of deal with them where they are. Um, um, in the process of, of talking on this, you try to elicit and reinforce change talk and self-efficacy talk. I can do this uh, as opposed to uh, discouraging and pessimistic talk. Um, and really, in a lot of health psychology, um, especially if you're working with patients over a period of time, the idea is that uh, you don't really want to move ahead to the plan unless there's sufficient motivation because you're just asking for failure. And failure, in addition to not getting the treatment, the failure experience itself can be detrimental to, to the patient engaging in treatment and getting help and, um, and adapting well. Um, and of course, this depends some on the particular context and patient and how much time you have and things like that. Uh, but I think the idea is useful that you have to individualize this. Um, activity scheduling, uh, it's important to clearly specify exactly what you want the behavior to be. Um, um, you know, where are they going to sit in front of the light box? When are they going to do it? Um, I'm sure we mostly do that, but again, I think it's, it's useful to think about this as a method to enhance the behavior change of the client. And it looks a little different when you think about it that way as opposed to just telling them what they should do. Um, you might have to demonstrate or practice the activity in session. Um, it would not hurt, I imagine a lot of people do this, uh, to have a light box in your office and have somebody actually sit in front of it and see exactly what you're talking about so that they then know what to do. I think a lot of times, and this isn't specific to light treatment, this happens in other kinds of therapy too, we tell the person what to do, it seems obvious to us that the patient doesn't have a clue. Um, so we really need to, to be sure that's true. And consider factors that are going to impede and facilitate success, and by success I mean making these, doing these behaviors. Um, um, so, you know, the, um, I can sit in front of the light box for half an hour every morning at six o'clock, except that I need to get my kids ready for school. So you have to figure out how are you going to work around that to make it happen, and thinking about the factors that can impede or facilitate uh, uh, those behavior changes is good. Um, then there's also recording. Uh, if the behaviors are done, this is a little different than recording how you're feeling, your response to the light treatment, which obviously is important also. But if you want to create behavior change, you want to then assess the behaviors and see if they're changing. Um, and so you need to then specify what behaviors you want recorded, like what time they're sitting there, how far away they're sitting, how long they're sitting. Um, and you need to give them a system for doing that. So you want to have forms to fill out that, to facilitate that. Um, I see this happen, I know, in psychotherapy sometimes. They'll say, well, keep a journal. Well, keeping a journal, that might have its own value, but keeping a journal doesn't have much value for this. You have specific things that need to be assessed, and you need to facilitate the patient's ability to do that. Um, and um, also, this is partially for the patient's benefit, and it's useful to explain why it's useful for the patient to do this, um, and what the benefits to the patient are going to be, and it's also important for feedback to the clinician. So if I want the uh, patient to give feedback to the clinician, what do I need to do to help that behavior happen? Well, I need to do, what do I mean by feedback to the, to the clinician? You know, what information do I want? When do I want you to give it to me? What, by what method do you want me to transmit? Do I want them to transmit it? All of these things being made specific and concrete facilitate the successful behavior changes that you're looking for so that those behavior changes can deliver the, the light treatment. Um, and so these are not insignificant uh, parts
of the treatment. And one, as I was thinking about this, one thing I thought is that, is that I noticed I was not using the word to things to do to enhance the treatment. Because I think that makes it seem sort of nice, it's good, but it's sort of ancillary. Because this is the delivery system, these are really the things to do to actually deliver the treatment. Not just to enhance the effect of the treatment, to actually deliver the treatment. So I was talking, actually talking about some of the self-monitoring ones um, already about the rationale for the monitoring, the definition of the targets being monitored, can the client actually um, um, do that? So for example, if you ask people to um, report their mood and you have a patient who's alexithymic and isn't really aware of their moods, they can't do that. So you actually need to check that they understand what these targets are and are capable of, of discriminating them. Uh, and recording forms, and I talked about reporting to the clinician. So in conclusion, I'll go back to my first slide um, in terms of uh, the things I wanted to, to uh, talk about and the conclusions based on uh, this uh, little review. Uh, psychological factors play a role in the pathogenesis of sad symptoms. Um, and also in um, the pathogenesis of the associated distress and impairment that our clients um, and their relatives often are concerned about. Um, that direct treatment of the cognitions and behaviors can have positive therapeutic effects. Um, and also that light treatment can be uh, more effectively delivered by attention to the behaviors that actually constitute the delivery of light treatment. Um, and that can be done using established, empirically supported behavioral interventions uh, that are well written up um, in the literature. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and I'd be happy for any questions or discussion. Nori? Thank you, Michael, for your very fascinating talk. It's stirred up so many thoughts and questions in my mind. I'll Good. just <laughs> like to address a few of them. The first is showing the changes all the way from the equinox, uh, both in the fatigue and in the psychological symptoms, really shows how long the syndrome goes on for. Mm. A lot of clinicians who are focusing only around November, December are missing those early months. And I think that's uh, a shame because, as we all know, the earlier you can climb in and do something, the better off you are. In looking at the factors that move a person from a pure vegetable. If you're changing to another topic, can I make a quick yes, comment on that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I completely agree. And I think, that's the wrong picture. Um, and I think the things that struck me about this, although I think they're very preliminary because the study wasn't exactly designed to do this, is how early the vegetative symptoms start, much earlier than we think. Um, and that the psychological symptoms actually peak and persistent peak beyond when the vegetative, this is really hard to tell if that's a really meaningful decline, but there's a hint that already by December, maybe even November, the, the symptoms on average are starting to get less, which is not what we would necessarily think. Um, but the psychological symptoms keep on going. And I wonder if because most patients report that their worst months are January and February, that that feeling worse is actually more related to the psychological symptoms than it is to the vegetative changes. And there's some other studies we have in non-seasonal that suggests an explanation, if that's the correct. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Uh, the other thought I had was, in moving the symptoms from the purely vegetative to the psychological, I think the role of external stress is an important factor. Mm -hmm. I first thought about that when the basic scientist, Nicholas Morozovsky, who wrote the classic hibernation in the hypothalamus, said, when you take a hibernating squirrel and you start interfering with the hibernation and expecting them to give a behavioral response, they basically look depressed. And so I think that a lot of therapy can be geared towards what can modulate stress. For example, don't undertake a deadline that's due on April 1st. Take a deadline that's due on September 1st, so you've got your summer. Or a, a mother with kids to get more childcare help, for example, and very often, these people feel very guilty and not entitled to be reaching out for help. So sometimes it means bringing in, in the spouse. And uh, with, uh, with us, so I think 
anything that mediates stress, which I don't actually see fully represented in your model, I think would be good. Right, no, I, I agree. Then, the, and it's not represented in my model. Or if the, it's represented in my head as a number of things that might be contributing. I think that's important. And I think one of the things, Kelly Rowland's book is called Coping with the Seasons because one of the thing, one piece of what she talks about is what you're talking about, which is how do you cope with these stresses that happen during the seasons. And I will just end with a, a short anecdote, uh, if you'll excuse me. Sure. You don't always, what your, your, the, 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 you know, plans of mice and men gang off the glay, and I had a book deadline that I had planned to finish in the autumn and with publication extensions, it went through the winter. And of course, as I have documented in my writings, I've got sad myself. So there I was in the winter under deadline pressures and using light and a patient comes in whom I have given Botox treatment to in addition to light and medicine and he says you know light and medicine are great but this year I'm really feeling fantastic with the addition of yet another treatment so when he left I called my friend the dermatologist I said I'm coming round for some Botox <laughs> <laughs> came round got some Botox myself which I'd never had before and that evening I had a dinner engagement and I was actually euphoric and giddy. Mm. And I said to my friends, you know, I love you all very much, but this exuberance that you're seeing is not you, it's the Botox. <laughs> and, and you were looking great too. <laughs> Uh, this is as much a political question, but you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, the American Psychiatric Association considered homosexuality to be a disease. It was later, in uh, as understanding and appreciation came, it was decided that that was a mistake and it shouldn't be considered a disease. I raise that not because of that issue, but because psychiatry sometimes has been used in different parts of the world to. Um, politicize um, behaviors or to call things disease when they're not. So the question that I want to ask with regard to SAD, to the extent that um, s the psychological symptoms in combination with stress from the outside world could be a problem, um, is it a societal problem to some degree as far as the, so the expectations that society puts on people as opposed to a disease that the person has? Yeah. Um I can give some thoughts. There's no clear-cut answer to that question. Um, I think some of these emotion regulation and coping mechanisms like rumination and acceptance and things like that have a cultural component. And you do see differences in how much those sorts of coping mechanisms are used in different cultures where the attitudes uh, are different. So, for example, the, the one that first comes to mind is the idea that when something bad happens, it's my fault. Okay, that's less of a cognition in in um, collective cultures in the East, where responsibility is not focused on individuals; it's more collective. And I would expect then that those sort of responses might be different. Um, I think also in terms of the psychological factors, we even though a lot of these are are um, related to psychopathologies of one kind or another, we also tend to think of them as on a continuum, which I think gives a little bit less of a disease focus. And I think that's also how most of us think about uh, the vegetative changes in SAD. Uh, like I said, the, the data support that there's a normal distribution in the general population, but there are certainly people who are more extreme. And we can talk to our patients that, you know, the fact that you sleep more and eat more and gain weight and have no energy in the winter is an extreme manifestation of something that actually occurs to one extent, although sometimes very tiny, but to some extent in all people. And you don't have to feel like you're a separate person. So I think, I think, I mean, one reason I'm fascinated by studying SAD is that these issues come up in ways that they don't always come up so clearly in other, even other kinds of of mood disorders, um, and um, so I think we I, I think we can think about them somewhat differently and less in a disease model, and I think that that's actually useful. It, it is still important to recognize that if you've got these symptoms, you have a problem, and you really should come in for evaluation and treatment. Just because we don't think of it as a disease doesn't mean that you shouldn't come for treatment. <laughs> 
Michael, this is the first time in 28 years that we have discussed these matters, and they are so obviously central to our work. Thank you very much. Thank you.